Hello everyone, this is Final Draft, and you are listening to Everfree Radio Presents, and I'm here today with a guest that I've been looking forward to interview for a long time, Mareka Hendricks. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here over the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, virtually here. We're, we're, we're here together. Virtually here. Digitally or something. Yeah, something like that. A system of tubes, I've been told. I, I don't know. But anyway, uh, yeah. we don't worry about such things. <laughs> No, I can't, or my head will explode. Yes, it's, it's been known to happen. <laughs> but anyway, um, well, you are the voice of a very particular character on My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, which is Gilda. You you voiced Gilda. Yes, I did. She is a very particular character, that's for sure. <laughs> Before we get into My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, one thing a lot of people don't know about you is that you actually have voiced on My Little Pony before. If IMDb isn't failing me, and it's been known to do so... It does fail. It fails at times, and massively so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You actually voiced another pony in a show I haven't seen yet, Bright Brightly, I believe. Yes, that's right. You're absolutely right. So my first question for you is, how was it different recording for My Little Pony Runaway Rainbow as opposed to My Little Pony Friendship is Magic? Part of the difference, I mean, for me as a, as a performer is if people out there have, have seen this particular, you know, Bright's Brightly, uh, have seen anything that the, the DVDs and stuff that she was in, you know, it's like night and day. The characters are night and day. And so, uh, you know, partly from a story perspective, but from a character perspective, it was, it was like not even the same project. I mean, it's not the same project, but it wasn't even like the same, the same world to record one and, and then the other. And Bright Sprightly was a unicorn little pony kind of looking. She was really cute. And obviously, I mean, Gilda's not even a pony. You know, she's a griffin. This is something that's kind of fun to talk to you about because most of the voices on My Little Pony are the heroes. You get to voice a villain. Yeah. So my question then is, which do you enjoy voicing more? I mean, it, it, given that you you voiced both kinds of characters, do you enjoy voicing the like the the harsher villain type characters or the more bubbly main character types? I really enjoy voicing villains. Really and truly, just adore it. I think partly what's interesting about for me voicing a villain is my voice is very not villainy. My regular speaking voice is you know clear and sort of bubbly. You know, oftentimes I go to commercial auditions and the direction is, okay, Marika, you can bring your energy down like 125% because that's, you know, a different style of, of voice work. So the challenge in that is I love that. But, you know, oftentimes villains are so interesting because you have to come up with a backstory that explains for yourself their villainy. And sometimes that's you know, the, your imagination is a lot, is, goes wild in a different way than when you're playing the hero. You, know, you can create all sorts of tragic circumstances of why this villain is the way that they are that you don't, sometimes don't, you sometimes do, but, you know, you've certainly got a backstory with heroes and they can be very interesting characters, but I like that delving into some aspects of pain and awfulness. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> it's sunny in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I hear it's sunny in Philadelphia too. No, you know, but honestly, like, I'm, I'm interested because you're saying that when you act as a villain or when you act for a villain, I should say, uh, you kind of create a, uh, a backstory to inspire you. Do you often get, say, for example, when you were given the role for Gilda, did they give you any kind of pointers to say, OK, this is how she should be evil in this sort of way? Or is that something more where you kind of draw upon your own personal experiences or, you know, what you kind of come up with in in your own mind before you go and record? They certainly give you, when you audition for a character, most of the times they'll give you uh, some details about the character and their personality. Generally speaking, you get personality traits that are in the present. So how this character is now in this episode. There isn't often a whole bunch of backstory that describes why the person is the way that they are. And so you are often fairly free to come up with ideas that aren't detailed from production. Are there any such ideas that, that you can remember from your development of Gilda or any other kind of villainous character that you played? Oh, yeah. I, um, for my favorite villain that I've ever played is... Um, is Revy from Black Lagoon, and she is 
you know, I, I created some things in my mind about who she was and where she came from that I didn't know initially. That actually, as the series developed, because obviously you see, I mean, it was dubbing, so the stuff existed before I dubbed it, and the storylines existed before I dubbed them. But I chose to not look at that stuff and come at it from my own perspective. And so, so there's some things that I made up in my mind about her and who she was that actually became, you know, true, were, were true to the character because when you do flashbacks, and you start realizing, oh, that's interesting, you know, from uh, realizing that, oh, I kind of attacked this from the right perspective. Well, and I would say almost that Revy is kind of more of an anti-hero, but still, and I'm glad you brought her up because I know that a lot of fans of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic are also fans of Black Lagoon. Uh, I have several friends who are huge fans of, of the series. Thank you. And it's a fun series to watch, too, because you're not the only MLP veteran that voices on the English dub. Tabitha St. Germain is on there. Kathy yep. Westluck is on there. So yep. it's almost it's almost in a sense like a PG-13 rated R interaction between the characters. I've seen a couple episodes myself, and it cracks me up to hear, you know, Kathy yelling at Tabitha, yelling at, at you, and it, it just, it's fun. It is pretty funny. I agree with you. You start to make those, you start to overlap like, oh, this person played that and that and that and that. And if you put all their characters together in a room, it'd be an interesting party. In my experience, I've always described Vancouver as the largest small town I've ever been to. I agree. Because it seems like everybody knows somebody who knows somebody there. And even if you've just only been there a couple days, you're going to run into somebody who worked with somebody else who worked with somebody else. And so it's funny when these projects come up, because if I hear one name that's associated, say, with MLP or, or DHX, it ends up being that they've worked with a same group of people elsewhere as well. So it's kind of fun. For me, it was at least when I was watching uh, Black Lagoon, it, it, it was amusing. <laughs> yeah, totally. I agree. I have a question that I need to ask on behalf of a lot of Black Lagoon fans out there sure, then. Sure, Which is, was voicing Revy cathartic for you? No. No. It was not cathartic. No, it was rewarding. It was incredibly fun. Uh, the most fun, the most enjoyable character I've ever played besides um, another character, and one other character that I play on a, another show. It is not cathartic because... Every performer does things their own way, um, and every performer has different ways to approach their work and, and ways to prepare and stuff like that. But for me, the, the work that I do is very strongly about the, the character and is very strongly about the story. My own personal feelings and my own personal needs are met outside of my work. Mm. Therefore, I don't have any sort of therapy that is negotiated while I'm playing a character. I f truly focus on the character and not what what I can give the character rather than the what the character will give me. Is that a philosophy that you applied as soon as you got into voice acting? Because I know that there are some voice actors out there who definitely do draw upon, you know, personal experiences to fuel the emotions of their characters. Drawing on your own emotions does come into play, but I know I've had conversations with many a person, diff actors, non-actors, about, for example, how would it feel to play a character who is beat up and left for dead? I've never been beat up and left for dead. I'm very lucky that that's never happened to me. And I mean that in all seriousness, without any hint of, you know, trying to be funny. But what I do know if I had to play a character who had to go through that life experience, I know what it feels like to be terrified, to be helpless, to be humiliated, to be angry, and to be in pain. Those things I know, those things I've experienced in my life. So I would venture to say that there are a limited number of experience, of, of emotions that one can have. There are infinite degrees of emotion. And you've got to find the right degree and the right type of emotion to apply to a given situation, whether you've been in it in real life or not. No, I think that's actually very true. And this is something I mentioned in a lot of interviews, and I'm sure the audience is going to groan when I mention it here, but I actually am a high school speech coach. And although I do public address, I also occasionally work with the dramatic students. Oh, that's, 
that's amazing. Yeah, it, it's fun. It's also a lot of work, but it's fun. Of course. <laughs> you know, drawing upon that pathos for, at least for the, the dramatic students, is crucial. But I also see what you're saying, too, where you kind of keep almost a professional separation between the character and yourself. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I suppose what you would say about me is that I'm not a method actor. I go in and I make believe and then I go home. That's the fast and easy way to say it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is the, it is the fast and easy. Um, no, no, no. I think you're right, though. Depending on what you're doing and who you're playing, things can get dicey pretty quickly. I've done a lot of theater in my career and I've been in rehearsal situations where I've had my head in my hands, where I, the director is, you know, psychoanalyzing somebody in the room, getting into personal things that have nothing to do with the character, that have everything to do with the actor themselves. And I have turned to a cast member and said, I don't want to come in tomorrow to work when that person brings a gun. I just don't think it's the right way to go about it. I realize cartoons are a different, you know, a different ball of wax, but I just, yeah, I just, that's just me. It's just, it's just me and how I choose to process my work. It's something though that I've also heard before as well. So, I mean, I think at least what I've seen with my students and what I've heard from, you know, voice actors and, and actors in general that I've spoken with, it just kind of depends on each individual, which system works best for them. I think you're right. I mean, different. This is, you know, certainly I wouldn't judge somebody who who does this way from an acting perspective as an actor. As long as you come to the gig and you do the job properly, it doesn't really matter to me how you how you processed it or how you prepared or didn't prepare. I do a little bit of uh, voiceover teaching, and um, I always tell the, the 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 students that I'm teaching that acting is not a free for all. If you're doing theater. And there's a, there's a glass of water on the table and you decide one night, just because you're so into it, that you've got to, it's absolutely necessary for you to take that glass of water off stage with you. And the next person who comes on that stage needs that glass of water to do their scene. That's not cool as far as I'm concerned. That is not cool. I worked with a theater director many times who said an actor has to be two people, the character and the actor who has to remember not to take that glass of water off with them. Mm. Going back then, uh, back before the days of, of My Little Pony and, 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 and voiceover, uh -huh. how did you get into acting? How did you get into voice acting eventually? I mean, how did that start for you? Um, well, I started acting as a teenager. I'd always wanted to be a performer from the time I was like five years old. And so I was always working towards that goal. I took, you know, I took dance classes and I went, I ended up going to ballet school. And, and while I was at ballet school, they actually, you know, they, 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 they have times where they call you into the office and talk to you. And, and they said, you know, you really aren't going to be a ballerina. And I was partially devastated, but we had my ears pricked up to hear the next, you know, part of the sentence and they said we think you need to get an agent because we think that you can you can act your the 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 things that you bring to the stage are things that you should develop and so i that was part of my journey into into i'd always wanted you know like i'd always wanted to play annie i'd always certainly been interested in doing acting rather than dancing um and so that was sort and had had some experience doing that stuff but that was kind of part of the impetus and then um and then got an agent and then voiceover happened because I was doing a play and I had to cry like a baby in the play it's a long <laughs> story but it was the director's concept for me to sit on the front of the stage and do the vocalizations of my character who was a baby in this particular scene and my agents came to see the play and were like you should be doing voiceover and so that's kind of how that started. I took a workshop, which I highly recommend for people who live in a big center and want to start doing voiceover. I mean, any acting, um, any medium, it's good to take classes or workshops with a casting director. Um, and so I took a workshop with a casting director and sort of that was the, that was the beginning. And so I know that a lot of people who go into voiceover and go into voice acting uh, actually start off in doing uh advertisements, that sort of thing. Did you go through that process as well? Or did you start off in anime? I mean, how did you begin when you started in voice acting? I did a couple things when I was a teenager, like, like almost like PSA stuff. 
And then when I seriously started, when that when that thing happened, where my agents came to see that play, they just submitted me for animated series. And I think that it was like either the first or second thing that I had auditioned for. It was a lead in an animated series. And I booked that bizarrely. And um, and then it sort of started from there. I have certainly worked commercially a fair amount, but I did start off basically doing animation. That's that's where I began. Do you find that working on, say, anime projects such as, well, Black Lagoon or uh, Gundam or any of the other ones that you've been on, Inuyasha, do you find that working on those programs are significantly different than how you have worked on, say, My Little Pony or the other, um, say, Western-style animations that you've done? Yes, they are very different. And part of, you know, what makes dubbing essentially. Um, a challenge is that you've got a parameter to fit yourself into. You know, you've got to match those lip flaps. If you think something should take five minutes to say, and you've only got a minute to say it, well, you better get it out in a minute because it's there and it's for you to, it's, it's your job to get it done. It takes a special skill to do that, I think, to just realize that you need to do what's necessary. With the prelay, you know, Western cartoons and stuff like that, where you're actually, you know, Recording before the animation is done, you certainly have a lot more freedom. Well, that's something I've heard before, too. But I'm curious, for the dubbing, for the anime dubbing, I should say, mm -hmm. is that a skill that you've had to practice? Say, do you take the script and you practice matching it to the actual lip flaps? Because it's an interesting concept to me. I'm, I'm, yeah. I've never had to do that, and I don't imagine most of the audience here has ever had to do that either. But it's something you don't really think about when you watch a dub of an anime, that it's usually done in such a way that it matches so well. You know, the crazy part is you don't get any advance um, viewing of the actual stuff. You go into the studio that day and you've had access to the scripts, but you've had no access to, to video. You get a script that has, pardon me, it has time code on it. So, you know, if you look at the time code, you certainly have an idea of how long you have to say those sentences that they've written for you. But until you get to the studio, that's when you see the picture and that's when you see the lip flaps. And that's when you're like, oh boy, uh, okay, that's how long I have to do this or that's what I've got to fit myself into. It's a great exercise. It really sharpens your skills, I think, as an actor because you've got to get it done. Well, and I just realized too, thinking about this, that, you know, I have a couple of friends who are involved in the abridging community. And I don't know, have you actually ever watched an abridged series, given that you've been involved in so many animes? No, I don't think I've ever watched an abridged series. No, I mean, it's, but I suppose that's like a book, right? The abridged version of such and such a long, long, long novel. Yeah, abridged series tend to be kind of comedic, shorter versions of the shows. They take the footage from an anime and they take the sound effects, but then they revoice it actually and oh. usually cut it down and try to make it humorous. And I know somebody who's currently voicing Revy for an abridged version of Black Lagoon. I would love to see that. Uh, well, I will definitely pass that along to you, by the way. Um, okay, please do. Thank you. Yeah. But I, I imagine that in, in this case, Jesse, who, you know, the fans of MLP know as no acting, she does a, a fan voice for Final Scratch, one of the, the side characters. She must have to kind of sync her movements to an abridged version of the same movements that you had to voice. And I, I, I just kind of made that connection right now. <laughs> yeah, it's like micro universes all colliding. It's a abridging voicing inception sort of thing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's interesting. That's cool. I'm going to send you that afterwards, by the way. Um, Please do, because I had no clue that that even went on. <laughs> so moving on to My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. You voiced Gilda in just one episode in Griffin the Brush Off. Yep. I know that for My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, the way that they voice the show at DHX in Vancouver is that they actually bring in you know, the whole cast into the recording studio and that it that you're actually acting around the other characters was that the case for your episode yes it was we were in together in a group how do you think that group dynamic affected how you characterized gilda because gilda by the way is a very popular character even if she is a villain there's a lot of people who uh <laughs> who find her to be humorous <laughs> <laughs> you, you laugh at that, but it's true. A lot of people like her as a as a character because she's just so so just outrageous. She's pretty outrageous. Um, I mean that's great. I'm really glad that people liked her because you know on in, in, on a very basic level she's pretty unlikable. So I, I like I'm, I'm glad that's great. 
people like to not like her as well because she did in the episode she did one thing and of course it's the writers not you but this uh yeah she did one thing which the fandom considers unforgivable and that's that she made fluttershy cry in a scene it's pretty unforgivable i'm right there with all of them (laughs) but uh how did you develop then the sassy approach you gave gilda did you have any influences in the studio there or was this something you kind of came in and said okay i'm gonna do gilda this way In the audition, they had sort of directed in a certain way, and so I was fairly clear about what that might be like once I got into the studio. And some of what makes our job so easy sometimes is the quality of writing. Oftentimes, the character can be really inherent in the writing. It's a bit hard to explain, but if it's well-written, the character just blossoms from the writing. And so that was really a pleasure for me to just be able to speak those words and then it, it, and it just comes out, the, the character comes out. We did have to do some adjusting because, you know, my voice is not raspy naturally, as you can all hear. Um, it's rather like an arrow right through your eyeball. It's not that bad. Come on. <laughs> okay, well, sometimes I have to keep a lid on it. So because I was adding some, you know, rasp and kind of growly thing, which they kept saying, you know, make sure you keep that growl in. You know that she's a lion, right? So you want to have that kind of roar ever present, potentially, is how I kind of thought of it in my mind. You know, I had to be careful not to bump up against Ashley, Rainbow Dash, because Ashley's got a really awesome, cool tone that has a, has a rasp to it. So we had to make sure that we were careful that I wasn't going too high. I initially came in with a little bit of a higher tone, a younger sound. So we wanted to make her growly and a little bit older sounding so that I didn't bump up against Ashley. So Ashley and I really kind of worked to make sure that that didn't happen. Do you, by chance, still remember what your original version of Gilda sounded like? No, I don't remember. But it was slightly higher pitched. I made her slightly younger. I know that. It was like a... I don't even know. (laughs) Uh, Aren't I terrible? No, it's fine. I've been at conventions several times when people have asked me to do the voice for such and such character. I was just at a convention in Calgary and somebody asked me to do the voice of Luna Maria Hawk from Gundam Sea Destiny. No clue. Absolutely no clue. And I was like, was it like this? And the sheer look of disappointment that came across a bunch of those fans' faces shaking their head like, no, that's not it, was so horrible. I'm never doing that again. (laughs) I felt awful. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Lord. You know what? I wouldn't feel too awful, though, because I think the thing is that a lot of people don't realize is that voice actors such as yourself have to do so many different voices. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people forget how many voices you guys do. I know that you know I work with Lee Tokar on fan build, you know, and I also know him from, well, obviously he voiced a, a couple characters in My Little Pony. And he tells me that the only way he's ever been able to remember the voices he's done because he's voiced, you know, 6,000 episodes of whatever series is that he just tries to remember one line from each of the characters if he can, but that oftentimes he's not able to. And it's just like you said, it's like, well, did it sound like this? And then, you know, somebody might be a little bit disappointed or something. But again, it's, it's that you've got such a volume of characters you've had to do. Yeah. And I agree with Lee. When you're doing a series, I played Yasmin in Bratz, and I had a line that I had from her that got me into her character and her voice just in one sentence. But I did a ser- I did, you know, the second, um, they did the first season of the series in Los Angeles, and then they moved it up to Vancouver. So I did the second season and a bunch of DVDs. Because you do that character so many times, that is something that's much easier for me to come up with and remember. But there are other things that you either didn't do very many episodes of, you know, so it, so it is difficult to remember. You're absolutely right. And it's not like I, I liked Yasmin better than I liked Luna Maria. It's just that it just was the, one of the things that just happened to stick in my head, that sentence. Speaking of conventions, there's a convention coming up next week. Las Yay! Pegasus Unicon. Dun, dun, dun. Yay! In Las Vegas. <laughs> and uh, it, it's my first time in Vegas, so I'm really excited for it. But I'm also excited because there are going to be a lot of the writers at this convention as well. So cool. The writer of Griffin the Brush Off, y- your character's episode, Cindy Morrow, yep. she's going to be there. So that's going to be kind of neat, too. Yep. So that 
begs then the question that a lot of people always want to know, which mm-hmm. I know you're going to get asked at the convention at least 20 times, so please let me apologize in advance for asking it myself. But... Do the voice of Luna Mario? <laughs> That's for later. I was going to ask that okay. later. <laughs> <laughs> the question I have is, when did you find out about the brony fandom? Because it's an odd little thing. Um, it's been exploding in size, of course. Mm -hmm. When did you find out and have you run into any of the bronies yet? Or is that something you're going to experience for the first time in Vegas? Oh, I've seen like a few individual bronies here and there at the con that I went to in Calgary, Alberta at the beginning, uh, at the end of the year, there was some bronies there, but no, I have not seen a thousand or whatever. But I've certainly heard lots of stories. I probably became aware of how popular the show was and the whole brony aspect of the show. I don't know, maybe like a year ago when the people that I work with started going to these cons and, and, and hearing about the type of environment that it was and the, and the f- amount of fans that came out and, and all that stuff that, so I pr- maybe about a year ago, I'd say. And this will be my first time experiencing a My Little Pony convention, like an actual, It's for that. It's not for anime in general or cartoons in general. Yeah. Well, what was your reaction when you first heard about it? Because I've I've heard varying reactions, actually. Some people have said, well, you know, it was surprising. Some people have said, yeah, well, it's a great show. You know, duh. What was your reaction when you heard that there were a bunch of adult guys watching a My Little Pony show? I think I was less surprised maybe than some people just because I've worked fairly extensively in anime. And that's the anime fandom. Seems to be similar a group like, you know, men rather than like teenagers watching, you know, uh, Gundam Sea Destiny. So I wasn't that surprised, to be frank. It's always interesting to see what show is the thing that people glom onto. That's the interesting part for me. Well, and I think it's interesting that you bring up the tie with the anime community because a lot of bronies I know, in fact, the majority of them are all fans of anime as well. And it is kind of neat to see the kind of the crossover between the two communities. I was just at a convention in Miami, Animate Miami, where they had a significant brony presence, but it was primarily an anime convention. Right. And it's just kind of, for me, interesting to see that now it's almost hybridized in that sense. Yeah. So looking to the convention, what are you looking forward to most to going to a brony convention for the first time? I am interested to see, you know, somebody tweeted something to me the other day that said, like, people breaking out to random song. Yeah, that happens. That is going to be just mind boggling for me. I'm going to feel like I'm in an episode of fame and Debbie Allen's going to burst around the corner with her cane and slap people with it. I'm looking forward to meeting people. You know, one of the things that I do enjoy is just talking to people, you know, face to face. And um, the thing that I'm mindful of is I can't work as an actor if I don't have an audience. And so I feel happy to be able to show that I'm grateful for their support. And if this is part of how I can be grateful for their support by coming to a a con and meeting folks and talking to them about different things, you know, maybe advising people if not even advising necessarily, but telling how I got my start. And so maybe another person is able to say, oh, well, that's how you, I might navigate this business. And that's my feeling. I like to be able to, I know it sounds like so oh out there, like a little like in the clouds hippiness, but I like to be able to give back something. Well, that's not too hippie. It's a little bit, but it's not too bad. <laughs> it's a little, it's a bit hippie-ish, but it's it's fine. Well, you know, I'll say this. One thing you should expect then, now that you've mentioned the random singing, which does happen, it does happen much to the chagrin of some of us, is that uh, given your character, you know that there are probably going to be people at this convention asking you to do the Junior Speedsters chant. Do you remember that? Um, No, I don't remember it. And I actually, I thought about it the other day because, of course, Gilda was not particularly pleased to do that chant. Yeah. So it was kind of a funny moment when we did it in the studio. We did, you know, obviously a couple takes of it, but I'm going to, I actually thought to myself, you need, you need to learn that. You either need to learn it or you need to bring it on a piece of paper because that's going to come out and you're going to be mighty embarrassed. You think it was bad that you didn't know the voice of Luna Maria. Well, it's going (laughs) to be bad with like 3000 people sitting there going, oh my God, she doesn't remember the chant. You know, actually, I think you could even play it off though, where you'd be like, well, Gilda didn't want to remember it or something, but yeah. (laughs) 
And that Luna Mario thing is going to haunt you forever, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yes, it probably is. I'm going to uh, although I'll probably do something stupid at this con, and then I'll have that to mount on my on the top of my wall of shame. You know what? Actually, though, at Brony conventions, what happens is that the voice actors there create memes, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Like Tabitha Saint Germain at Everfree Northwest created the meme quote "Look, there's a moose" during a, a voice actor panel because. She had a question she didn't know how to answer, so she said that. Now it's become this phrase that everybody in the Brony community uses over and over again. Oh. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because at these conventions, this is where it happens. Andrew Francis at uh, Camelot Gardens said the phrase, yeah, that's right, you know, in, in this voice. And now that's also become a thing. So who knows? I would actually guess that if you say the right phrase at the right time, T-shirts might be made. You never know. This is my goal now. This is my goal, to be a meme, to cre help create a meme. I don't think you're going to have too much of a problem with that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Well, we'll see. Maybe we should make a bet on it. It is Vegas. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and if you need any help with that, just let me know. Just saying. Okay. Just saying. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, so getting back to the online portion of the fandom, have you poked around at all and seen any of the artwork or the music or the fanfics or any of the stuff that the fandom has created i mean have you had even a inkling of curiosity about it yeah i've gone and looked at a bunch of things like i was on deviant art recently and um looking at pictures and you know i put out a request on twitter because i needed some fan art to for for signings in vegas and the other cons i'll be going to of course i have done a little poking around with stuff First of all, like the amount of talent and creativity and and get up and go that everybody has to create these things and, and be involved in something that they love, I think is so amazingly it's 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 so inspiring to want to be involved and participate. Like I just love it. I think it's so cool. I certainly haven't poked around as much as I as I could or else I'd be doing that all the time. But I probably also haven't poked around as much as I should to look at things. I'm fairly like, I, I get teased quite a bit because I watch a ton of sports. <laughs> and so I think probably the people in my building think that there's something wrong with me. First of all, I don't go out to a job every day from nine to five because I'm a voice actor. And I'm either practicing for an audition. So there's ridiculous noises coming from inside my apartment. <laughs> or I'm talking in a stupid voice to my cat. Or I am screaming obscenities at referees. Now, for the record, anybody who's ever been around a cat has talked stupid voices to the feline. I mean, that's just how it's done. It is how it's done. And, and, and frankly, if it wasn't done like that, my cat would have something to say about it. She is quite expressive, shall we say, in her, in her needs and wants. <laughs> I have headphones on right now while we're, while we're talking because she refuses. She can't stand the sound of Skype. She refuses to be quiet. We would be listening to her howling meowing in the background because i think it's got something to do with like the pitch that comes out of my laptop when the sound from skype so i have to conduct skype everything with headphones on i've heard that uh cats don't have owners they have slaves i've, I've heard that said somewhere yep cats i've heard you know similar cats don't have owners they have staff yeah, same thing I, I like that one better i think well, okay, so you've seen the DeviantArt stuff you've seen you know you maybe you've heard some of the music out there etc I'm going to ask what people who have listened to this podcast before know as the evil question. I'm going to ask an evil question of you. Are you ready? Oh, God. Y yes. It's an evil question, but, but I have to ask it because I've asked it of, of all the voice <laughs> actors I've interviewed. If you could have one thing from the Brony fandom, whether it be a work of art, a piece of music, something like that, what would it be and why? I... You see, it's an evil question. <laughs> No, I actually have a really, I have an immediate answer. That's awesome. I collect t-shirts. If I was going to have anything, I would love like a t-shirt with like a guild or something on it. I know that there's things available. I don't know. I just think that would be awesome. Is there something like about Gilda's character that you find especially amusing that say artists that I may or may not know might possibly be able to incorporate into a t-shirt design possibly? That's cool. Uh, one of my, somebody actually sent me something on Twitter the other day that made me laugh. 
it was the picture, it was a picture, like a screenshot, I guess, um, of Pinkie Pie hugging Gilda and the expression on her face was, and I commented on this and it started a whole kind of conversation on, on Twitter about that's the way my cat looks when I hug her. And then what happened with Gilda is what happens with my cat. The claws come out. There's this momentary like shock of like, this is actually happening to me. And then bang, things get ugly. <laughs> so you want a t-shirt of things getting ugly? <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. I also, you know what, I would love, this is something else that, I don't even know if I'm answering the question right. I think you are, I think you are. Okay, because there's a thing that I thought would be so awesome to have, but I didn't know. I'm so new to these con things and the My Little Pony thing and the, and what you're supposed to do on Twitter and what you're supposed to do to create things and what you're supposed, how do you're supposed to, basically I thought it would be so hilarious for a picture, there would be Gilda and she can't have a cutie mark for obvious reasons, but if she had a cutie mark, that was basically a picture either of Revy on her butt or like the two guns, two <laughs> hands, you know, that's her cutie mark. <laughs> I guess in her case, it would have to be a brand or something. Yeah, exactly. Like a brand or some sort of like something. Well, you know what? I think that this possibly could be arranged. I know a few people who, who will probably jump at the opportunity. I should say, too, that you do have a Twitter account that needs more followers. It's at Mareka Hendricks, right? Yes, that's right. I mean, I'm certainly happy with the followers that I have. Um, um, and, you know, as it grows, then it grows. If it doesn't, then that's okay, too. It, it will probably grow. It, these things tend to happen. That's what it seems like. You know, it's, it's interesting because I'm still navigating how to use Twitter. Well, you know what I've learned is that with Twitter, if you tweet anything that's even remotely interesting to you, and if you retweet things that are remotely interesting to you, then it will remotely interest somebody else, and then th and that's how it grows. Okay, that's cool. Remotely. That's actually, that's a great, like, little tidbit. That's rule one on how to use Twitter. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> that was useless, but thank you. Well, okay, so before I wrap this up here, I just wanted to know if there are any upcoming projects you'd like to talk about or, you know, what are you working on now? I just finished season six of Johnny Test. We're just finishing doing pickups for that season. So that's awesomely excellent. Another somewhat off the wall character slightly in terms of being a little bit, shall we say, overreactive to certain things. <laughs> I'm doing like a, f I don't, I don't think I can tell you the name of it. I'm doing, uh, I just finished doing a, like a feature length film. I don't know. It's probably going to be DVD released. Um, and I have songs to record coming up. So that's going to be fun. Oh, what's that for? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. My character was pretty funny too. So I did some episodes of The Little Prince. To me, that's really interesting that they made that into a show. Yeah, it is. And it's beautifully animated. So that is awesome. I am working on a series. I'm playing one of the regular characters on a series. It's been announced. The person who is the star has talked about it on Twitter and has also been announced that they're the, that they're the main, the lead character, but I'm still not quite sure if I'm allowed to talk about it. So I'm just going to say I'm two thirds of the way through playing a very fun, character i don't know i was gonna thinking of a descriptive word but i'm not even gonna go there for for this particular show that sounds so ridiculously top secret and just like oh mareka wow you are protecting the world's you're doing a thing for a place with people possibly yeah possibly but maybe not it might be recorded. It could also not be recorded, but you can't confirm or deny any of those facts. <laughs> I know it's just ridiculous, but I so badly don't want to get sued or fired. <laughs> no, no. You know what? You know what? You can say to all of it. You can say there are things in the works. There are things in the works. Isn't that wonderful? And it just covers everything, and it just it, it sounds informative, even if it isn't, and it's just great. Okay, well, Mareka Hendricks is the voice of Gilda in My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. She's notably the voice of Revy in Black Lagoon and multiple other characters in multiple other shows. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me. Thank you so much. It's been 
fun to laugh with you. It, it's fun to laugh sometimes. It's good. Just sometimes. Sometimes. Only sometimes. <laughs> Well, and, you know, for all of you out there who are going to be in Las Vegas, you'll be able to see Marika in person at Las Pegasus Unicon, February 22nd through the 24th. And recordings and live streaming of the convention will be posted at everfree.net. Again, I am Final Draft. Thank you for tuning in. And this has been Everfree Radio Presents. This is Final Draft, and you are listening to Everfree Radio Presents, and I'm here today with a guest that I've been looking forward to interview for a long time, Mareka Hendricks. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here over the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Virtually here. We're, we're, we're here together. Virtually here. Digitally or something. Yeah, something like that. A system of tubes, I've been told. I, I don't know. But anyway, I uh, yeah. we don't worry. It's a different recording for My Little Pony Runaway Rainbow as opposed to My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. Part of the difference, I mean, for me as a, as a performer, is if people out there have, have seen this particular, you know, Brights Brightly, uh, have seen anything that the, the DVDs and stuff that she was in, you know, it's like night and day. The characters are night and day. And so, uh, you know, partly from a story perspective, but from a character perspective, it was, it was like not even the same project. I mean, it's not the same project, but it wasn't even like the same, the same world to record one and, and then the other. And Bright Sprightly was a unicorn little pony kind of looking. She was really cute. And obviously, I mean, Gilda's not even a pony. You know, she's a griffin. This is something that's kind of fun to talk to you about because most of the voices on My Little Pony are the heroes. You get to voice a villain. Yeah. So my question then is, which do you enjoy voicing more? I mean, it, it, given that you you voiced both kinds of characters, do you enjoy voicing the, like the, the harsher villain type characters or the more bubbly main character types? I really enjoy voicing villains. Really and truly just adore it. I think partly what's interesting about, for me, voicing a villain is my voice is very not villainy. My regular speaking voice is, you know, clear and sort of bubbly. You know, oftentimes I go to commercial auditions and the direction is, okay, Marika, you can bring your energy down like 125% because that's, you know, a different style of, of voice work. So the challenge in that is I love that. But, you know, oftentimes villains are so... About such things... <laughs> No, I can't, or my head will explode. Yes, it's, it's been known to happen. <laughs> but anyway, um, well, you are the voice of a very particular character on My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, which is Gilda. You, you voiced Gilda. Yes, I did. She is a very particular character, that's for sure. <laughs> Before we get into My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, one thing a lot of people don't know about you is that you actually have voiced on My Little Pony before. If IMDb isn't failing me, and it's been known to do so... It does fail. It fails at times, and massively so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you actually voiced another pony in a show I haven't seen yet, Bright Brightly, I believe. Yes, that's right. You're absolutely right. So my first question for you is, how was... Interesting, because you have to come up with a backstory that explains for yourself their villainy. 
And sometimes that's, you know, the, your imagination is a lot, it goes wild in a different way than when you're playing the hero. You can create all sorts of tragic circumstances of why this villain is the way that they are that you don't sometimes don't, you sometimes do, but you know, you've certainly got a backstory with heroes and they can be very interesting characters, but I like that delving into some aspects of pain and awfulness. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> it's sunny in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I hear it's sunny in Philadelphia too. No, you, no but honestly, like, I'm, I'm interested because you're saying that when you act as a villain or when you act for a villain, I should say, uh, you kind of create a, uh, 